watch the power of strange things. This summer, a supernatural force regained its full power after 40 years of floating in the atmosphere. Let me set the scene. A courageous young woman called Max finds herself in the lair of a monster who has been distorting her reality. What are you doing in here, Max? She must escape the hold he has over her. At the very moment when it seems she'll be lost forever, a strange musical crescendo fills the space. Rolling drums, a cello eerily distorted, a wash of sound. She is empowered. The battle is on. What could possibly save Max? As I'm sure many of you already realize, it's Running Up That Hill, the 1985 international hit by Kate Bush, English queen of art rock. And that song becomes a vital force in season four of the Netflix sci-fi juggernaut, Stranger Things. As for what happens next, well, you'll have to watch it to find out. But I can tell you the real life story. A whole new audience embraced the song and Kate's music in general. They found the voice of this woman they didn't know deeply relevant to our chaotic historical moment and to their own processes of self-definition, as the young British singer-songwriter Katie J. Pearson explains. It's been a crazy time just in life. And I think people like to have a song that is a ballad for them in their lives. Also, when you think about Stranger Things, this song was a protection, and so it's become a song of safety for people and respite from bad things in life. I think it's a song that has made people feel alive and made people feel hopeful. It's you and me. Soon after the show dropped, Running Up That Hill was the most played track in the world. It re-entered the charts on both sides of the Atlantic, and at 63, Kate became the oldest woman ever to pen a UK number one. It also became her highest charting single ever in America. After six million daily Spotify streams during the summer, Kate's renaissance remains in full swing, bringing the doyen back into the spotlight and ensuring her place at the center of the story of rock. No one was more surprised than Kate herself, who made a rare appearance on BBC Woman's Hour in ever-gracious acknowledgement. It's just extraordinary. I mean, you know, it's such a great series. I thought that the track would get some attention, mm. but um, I just never imagined that it would be anything like this. It's, um, it's so exciting, yeah. but it's quite shocking, really, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> the whole world's gone mad. Well, I mean, you know, 30 What a treat for the new fans exploring a career that began in 1978, one that extends across 10 splendiferous albums. And what a trip for lifelong Kate devotees like me, as everyone wakes up to what we've always known, that this woman's work, her music, builds worlds and can transform lives. I will say, just as an overall, it's my favorite thing about season four, the Kate Bush phenomenon. Among those who were taken aback were the directors of the series themselves, Matt and Ross Duffer. To see it take off that way, to see younger viewers be introduced to this artist that we've loved and we know a lot of people have a deep connection to, but if you're 12 years old, you probably, you may not have heard of her unless your parents have been pushing her on you. That's the most exciting thing. It's like kids finding her falling in love with that music and being impacted by it positively is I don't know, the best story for us to come out of this season. One life that Kate Bush's music changed was mine. Long ago, when I was not much older than Max and fighting my own monsters, adolescent mood swings, deep insecurities, and the sense that my feelings were just too big for the world, 
I happened upon Kate's first two albums at a church jumble sale in my hometown of Seattle. This was several years before running up that hill and its album, Hounds of Love, would make her an international star. In 1978, I was in high school, a chaotic, dreamy girl, unhinged by the ceaseless internal battle between desire and dispossession. Awkward and loud, I'd become accustomed to people telling me I was too much. Punk had taught me to be aggressive, New Wave had made me care about fashion, but I'd never be as sexy cool as Chrissy Hind or Debbie Harry. I needed a hero who would validate the weirdest parts of me. My unmanageable emotions, poetic pretensions, unwieldy desires. As I dropped the needle on track one of Kate's debut long playing album, The Kick Inside, I found her. What was I hearing? Those whale songs opening the track. That voice that leapt and dove like a sea creature. As the record played out, I began to recognize my own preposterous self in this unhinged pop. And in these songs, that beast was beautiful. What I heard in Kate's music at 18 was not, I suspect, that different than what millions have discovered during her current revival. To me, running up that hill always felt like her mainstream moment, too gentle by half compared to the clanging innovations of those early albums driven by the supernatural swoop of her voice. But what's happened in the last few months has made me think again. Hearing newly minted Kate Bush fans talk about what she means to them, I've realized it's all of a piece. Her musical curiosity, independence, and above all, unfettered imagination draws in people across generations and gives her work its timeless quality. Kate Bush's boldness vanquishes all kinds of fears. If a song like that is gonna help some young kids out, it's a very empowering song and makes you feel a lot of strength, so I think there's something really important about that. Kate's first album, The Kick Inside, dropped the year after punk broke, but her version of brashness wasn't about sneering at the queen. These songs were about spiritual enlightenment, ghostly romances, and childish wonderment, inspired by poetry and literature, most famously in her debut single released when she was just 19 years old. It's a hauntingly wonderful retelling of the doomed romance at the center of Emily Bronte's 19th century gothic novel, Wuthering Heights. The song begins where Bronte's story ends. It's written in the voice of its heroine, Catherine, who's died of love for Heathcliff, her match in moodiness and violent desire. She pleads with her still living ex to let her in through the window of the novel's titular estate. But in Kate's song, she doesn't just want comfort, she wants to spirit his soul away. To this teenager, it sounded like the perfect fatal romance, undeniable, florid, and disastrous. It got to number one in the UK, and suddenly Kate was explaining to the world how she came up with such a mesmerizing conceit. She'd recently watched the 1967 BBC adaptation with the very hunky Ian McShane in the Heathcliff role. Well, I saw a series on the television 
about ten years ago, and it was on very late at night, and I caught literally the last five minutes of the series where she was at the window trying to get in, and um, it just really struck me. It was so strong, and for years it's just been going around in my head like the basic story and and that visual image of her at the window. Who are you? And I thought it was just perfect material for a song. It's just so passionate and full of impact. It's great. And it, I read the book. You read the book. <laughs> you read the book later. Yeah, I read the book before I wrote the song because I needed to get the mood properly. This dreamy teenage genius was the perfect hero for a girl like me, whose love of poetry and late night cafes confused my suburban parents and football playing little brother. She was the perfect companion for someone with nascent aspirations to create my own stories with words, and I wasn't the only one. My name's Jeanette Winterson, and I'm a British writer. And I first came across Kate Bush in my late teens because she is born the year before me, so we're contemporaries. And it was just before I was going up to study at Oxford that I heard Wuthering Heights. I knew I wanted to write books, and there were very few role models, certainly none from the past that were offered on what was supposed to be one of the best humanities courses in the world. And I was looking for role models. I was looking for women who were creative and imaginative and who were unafraid to do their own thing in their own way, because I wanted to hear stories. I wanted music, but I wanted stories inside the music, and Kate Bush offered that. And the fact that she took a piece of literature and said, I'll make a song about that, that was fabulous. It was getting away from any ideas of elitism, of the canon, of classics, and saying, you know, this is full of emotional resonance, this book, and I will now morph it into something else. We know the story of Cathy and Heathcliff, but again, a woman who cannot, in the shape of Cathy, live the life that she wants to live. She's prevented from it. And there's that terrible line in the book, isn't there, where Heathcliff says, Cathy, why did you betray your own heart? And so many women have betrayed their own hearts. And Kate Bush was trying to tell us how not to betray our hearts. And that song is about that for me. It's not about wanting to be a singer-songwriter. It's about wanting to be creative. Kate was a precocious talent who began her musical journey as a child living in a grand old farmhouse on the outskirts of London in Kent. An odd point of origin for a pop prodigy, perhaps. But as Kate explained, her upbringing and especially her siblings shaped her far-reaching musical taste. When I was about six, seven, that sort of age, my uh, two brothers were getting into folk music a lot and they were going round to folk clubs and they'd often have evenings every week where a load of their friends would come round and as I got a bit older I started to join in and, and learn folk songs. I mean they were the first songs I really learned, sea shanties, that sort of thing. Some of them I still love to listen to because the stories are always so interesting, they're beautiful. Tonight with you love I mean to lay with me do me I'm a ding Kate started writing at around the age of 11, both poems and songs, spending hours at the piano evolving her voice. When I first started singing, I had an incredibly plain voice. I mean, I could sing in tune, but that was about it. I mean, I really wasn't that good. Um, And really all I did was uh, sing every day because I was writing songs, I would sing them. Um, I was concentrating much more on my writing and therefore my voice came through that. And every day I'd be at the piano for hours, so um, really it was just a gradual progression. By her mid-teens, Kate had literally written hundreds of songs. A friend of her brother's gave her demo tape to David Gilmour, the guitarist for one of the biggest bands in the world at the time, Pink Floyd. I went to visit her and recorded some more stuff and um, came to the conclusion that I didn't think the record companies would grasp what was great about her. So I decided to um, employ Air Studios, George Martin's studio. And when I originally listened through to all her music, of which there was about 40 or 50 songs, I think she was still 15 when I first met her, one song called The Man with the Child in His Eyes, leapt out at me. And that was the moment that I thought, how can this very young girl 
be singing something with words as intelligent and supposedly knowing as they were. And that was one of the three songs that we recorded as very glossy demos. And it is our version of it that is on the record. I hear him before I go to sleep and focus on the day that's been. I realize he's there. When she was 16, EMI Records signed Kate, but it was three years before she released her first album. This made her impatient. But the time was vital to her developing her confidence and her vision. She played in a pub band, and she studied mime as well as dance, so she was ready by the time she debuted Weathering Heights on Top of the Pops. And now making her debut on Top of the Pops is the exquisite Kate Bush with her new single, Wuthering Heights. Dressed all in black with a huge red flower behind her ear, she looks vaguely terrified. Out on the windy, windy but her storytelling dance moves and those unearthly vocal runs distinguish her from the usual pop ingenues. Here was a talent that the show's 15 million viewers were not prepared for. How could you leave me when I needed to? Among them was Tom Doyle, now a music journalist who's just finished a big book called Running Up That Hill, 50 Visions of Kate Bush. I remember the first time I saw Kate Bush on Top of the Pops. I was 11. It really was quite a surprising thing because, I mean, here was this young girl with this dance routine that was to become as famous as the song, really. And the thing that was strange about it was that it was a literally haunting song sung by someone in a falsetto that was like nothing you'd heard before. Now, she talked later about the fact that really she was assuming the character. That's why she was singing in such a high register. But people could not get their heads around this at all. The reaction to it was really polarised, actually. DJs, more than one DJ, like joking, saying that they were thinking that they were playing it at the wrong speed, 78 RPM rather than 45 RPM, right? The impact was incredible because, I mean, she went from nowhere to being a household name, more or less literally overnight. Now we have uh, a young person, uh, Basil Bush's uh, sister, who, as you know, was uh, responsible for that uh, great hit, uh, Withering Tights. Kate Bush and the Bushwhackers. Rolling the ball. I fell in love with this Kate, but only via recordings and video clips because she only toured once in the UK. Her sole American appearance was on Saturday Night Live in December 1978. I vividly remember her in an oversized trench coat and cool fedora singing Them Heavy People about her esoteric spiritual explorations. It was strange and glorious. This was somebody who was also too much and relishing it. She was like me, but winning. Kate's musical, lyrical, and spiritual dexterity continued over her next couple of albums. While many musicians were churning out love songs, Kate created ingenious narratives peopled by unexpected characters, songs that played out like theatrical scenes. One moment, we'd be with a mother grieving her son's death on the battlefield, the next inside the mind of a wife as she plans to test her husband's loyalty by posing as a Russian seductress. One of my favorites was Breathing, in which Kate became an unborn child, frightened both by her mother's cigarette smoking and the impending threat of a nuclear holocaust. Talk about drama. Here's 
Here's writer Jeanette Winterson again. That theatricality, that self-invention, was a heady mix. She was herself that was many selves. You know, she's made of mercury, so it's you can just split her into many selves that is still Kate Bush. She wasn't doing a Mick Jagger, uh, it, it's all about me. She was saying, it is about many me's, it's about multiple me's, it's about invented and theatrical me's. So it was performance layered on performance. And I liked that. I like that sort of Russian doll syndrome that she has, where you just keep finding another Kate Bush inside, slightly different to the one that's gone before. As she grew as a musician over the course of her first three albums, Kate began reaching for all kinds of sounds to flesh out her extraordinary fairy tales. The fourth, released in 1982, proved to be her sonic breakthrough, or in some people's minds, her undoing. It's one of Pop's wildest experiments produced by Kate herself. She called it the dreaming. For me, it was everything music could be and more. This is the extraordinary title track. Inspired by her own journeys down under, it tells the story of the destruction of Aboriginal lands by white colonizers. Singing in the voice of one of those male poachers, Bush expanded her story with a dizzying array of instruments, from the native didgeridoo to the whooshing one-stringed instrument known as a bull roarer, played by her brother Patty. She even enlisted the help of the legendary animal noisemaker Percy Edwards to evoke the creatures of the outback. Kate began production at the legendary Townhouse Studios in Shepherd's Bush, where she was joined by a young engineer, Nick Lane. Actually, I remember at the time of making the dreaming, I was still living at home with my mum and my brother in Fulham, and I get the tube to work, and I, I just remember I couldn't wait to get to the studio to find out what magical universe we were going to next, what mythical land and what were the characters going to be. It was very much like perhaps going to the theatre. I remember one day Kate turned up to the studio with her answer machine and I thought maybe she'd brought it in to get it repaired or something but she plonked it down on the desk and said we're going to record this today. First time I died. So we plugged it up and there was all these messages from her family and friends. And at the end of each of those messages, of course, it said, you know, goodbye. Hope you're well, goodbye, goodbye. It was all these different goodbyes. And so we dubbed it all onto quarter inch tape. And then I spent probably, God knows how long, chopping all the goodbyes together. And so if you go and listen to one of the most beautiful songs on there, All the Love, towards the end, you can hear it, it comes in. It seemed like a crazy idea, but it's actually very touching and very beautiful. In addition to manual audio DIY, Kate had what was then a cutting edge brand new piece of tech for creating new sounds, a digital workstation called a Fairlight CMI. The Fairlight is the first ever sampler that has a keyboard. In other words, you can record a sound into it and then the keys play that sound in the notes of a normal keyboard. It's a huge computer, a bit like an IBM. It looks like a massive fridge. Kate had been introduced to the Fairlight by her friend and sometime collaborator Peter Gabriel, whose own music helped take art rock into a new era. Here he is, getting rather excited about the synthesizer in a documentary made around the time Kate was in the studio. See, if I pick up this mic, for an example, 
and uh, press S for sample. We can put in the sound, I hope. Mummy! Over here we have uh, Mummy, the waveform, and it should be up on the keyboard. Kate's third album, Never Forever, was the first commercially released LP to feature the workstation. For the dreaming, she bought her own, making her the third owner of one in the UK. She and Nick spent hours playing with it, entranced by its possibilities. This is something we did quite often. Kate would go out and she'd just go, ah, we'd resample her singing a note and put it into the computer. And then this thing would chug away for something like 30 minutes to just save this one little, oh. (laughs) But then when you played it on the keyboard, it came out sounding different because the quality was so bad. It sounded interesting. I see the people working. I see it working for them. And so I want to join in. So we sat in my lap, for example, that, oh, that you hear is exactly that. It's a sample of her voice, her going, oh. This was the first time you could actually do that with one finger on a keyboard. For Kate, the Fairlight was like the wardrobe in C.S. Lewis's Narnia. She could loop and bend sounds, whether they were from the natural world, any instrument she liked, or her own body. You can hear it all over the album. On Houdini, there's this part which is rhythmically completely made up of clock sounds, you know, tick-tocks, and it's basically a grandfather clock that sampled and then played in a melody. So the other thing about Kate Bush, of course, is her voice. Her capability of altering the sound of her voice to be different characters. We got the job sized. The shop shop for business. The lookout has parked the car that kept the engine. There's a really good example of Kate zoning in on a character and singing with that character's voice is There Goes a Tenor, where she's kind of putting on this cockney accent that's a bit like something out of Oliver, right? So immediately you're transported into that sort of old London place. Writing on the Fairlight, Kate took on a dazzling array of characters. She was a cockney robber staging a bank heist, or a house that comes alive and brays like a donkey. The Dreaming told so many stories, but the album as a whole said one thing. A young woman could become anything she imagined. Not in that liberal feminist way of putting on a power suit and playing by the rules of men. I mean fantastically, like a supernatural being. Across the album's 10 tracks, Kate became male and female, old and young, ferocious and ethereal, even immortal. And there were songs about how taking charge of her own creative process gave her this power. Her audacity gave me courage. One of the things that thrilled me about Kate Bush was that she was able to use herself as her own invention. I come from a very poor background and I thought the only way I'm going to escape this, and it was a revelation, was to be able to read myself as a fiction as well as a fact. And I thought, if I can write my story, I can change the story. But you want to be able to invent yourself, have that creative purpose. And she did. What she was offering as an example was to say, 
that the self is made creatively. It's not just your background, your education, your family, your DNA, your direct experience. It's how you're going to take all that and remake it so that you are a living volatile, moving substance, uh, which doesn't need to be fixed in any mould. It needs to go on changing, developing. The Dreaming celebrates 40 years since release this year. I still love it, but others thought it was crazy. And Kate herself called it her mad album. Now that's not a bad thing, is it? Although some of the critical responses at the time were brutal, a few years later, it was great to hear Kate reflect on how important she felt the dreaming had been in her evolution as an artist. And uh, everyone was saying, oh, she's really gone mad now. You know, hey, listen to this. <laughs> it's a really weird record. But it, it was very important that it happened to me because it made me think, right, do I really want to produce my own stuff? You know, do I really care about being famous? And I was very pleased with myself that, no, it didn't matter as much as making a good album. It took three years after the Dreaming's complicated launch for Kay to release new music. When she returned, she demanded even more independence, recording in her home studio on the family farm in Kent. For Tom Doyle, that made all the difference. What happens is she becomes creatively autonomous. So rather than spending a thousand pounds a day in a studio, she uses the album budget to build the studio. And at this point, this is where she's completely creatively freed up. And she's also recording mostly with her then boyfriend, Del Palmer, who's a huge influence on that record. There's a sense of intimacy and relaxation, really. I still do. hearing that album for the first time when it was released in 1985. This music was definitely her most accessible. One of my favorite songs from it is the beautiful Cloud Busting. It tells the tale of maverick psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich, who built a machine to change the weather by accessing the erotic energy in the atmosphere. more was Kate braying like a wild animal and yelling her head off. But every time it Instead, she sang in a rich alto that was almost maternal. Like the sun out. I loved the mad Kate so much, it took time for me to recognize that this was the emergence of her mature voice and more powerful in its gracefulness. But you know the most indelible song from Hounds of Love. Now, Kate's signature song. When she played it on Terry Wogan's TV show, he called it a comeback, another sign that she was hitting the public sweet spot. Now though, a timely burst from a lady who hasn't graced the turntables with a new record for two years. It's nice to have her back. Running up that hill, it's Kate Bush. <laughs> As usual, Kate had a whole backstory behind the song, but ultimately not one she felt she could keep. I was trying to say that really a man and a woman can't understand each other because we are a man and a woman. And if we could actually swap each other's roles, if we could actually be in each other's place for a while, I think um, we'd both be very surprised. And I think it would lead to a greater understanding. And uh, really the only way I could think it could be done was either, you know, I thought a deal with the devil, you know, and I thought, well, no, why not a deal with God, you know, because uh, in a way it's so much more powerful, the whole idea of asking God to make a deal with you. You see, for me, it is still called Deal With God. That was the, its title. But we were told that um, if we kept this title, that it wouldn't be played in any of the religious countries. So Italy wouldn't play it, France wouldn't play it. And Australia wouldn't play it, Ireland wouldn't play it, uh, and that generally we might get it blacked purely because it had God in the title. Now, I couldn't believe this. This seemed completely ridiculous to me, and the title was such a part of the song's entity. Um, I just couldn't understand it. But nonetheless, although I was very unhappy about it, I felt unless I compromised that I was going to be um, cutting my own throat, you know. I just spent two, three years making an album 
and we weren't going to get this record played on the radio if I was stubborn. So I thought I had to be grown up about this, so we changed it to Running Up That Hill. This was the song that revived her reputation as a hit maker, saving her career. But she could never have known then that it was to play another surprising role when it became this year's cultural phenomenon. I'm Ross Duffer. and I'm Matt Duffer. Uh, collectively, we're known as the Duffer Brothers, and we're the uh, creators of Stranger Things. Running Up That Hill plays a huge role and probably a bigger role than any song has ever played in the history of our show. But it's big in the sense that it's not just about tone. It's not for the purposes of a montage. It's something that serves a real narrative purpose and sort of an emotional purpose in that it is the key to saving one of the characters in the show, which is Max. So Max has been targeted by Vecna, who's the big bad Freddy Krueger-esque villain in our show. She finds herself trapped in sort of his mindscape and Vecna feeds on the negative thoughts one has. And Max is going through, I would say, a difficult time. Her brother has just died and she's dealing with depression and guilt and all of these issues. And he's basically preying on that. And so she finds herself lost and that's how he would win ultimately. But then her friends on the outside realize that music is the tether to the real world, you know, which triggers all these memories for her of all the positive things in her life. And so by playing her favorite song, they're able to allow her a means of escape. It's a lifeline, essentially, is how we thought of it. Now! I think one reason we were excited about running up that hill in that scene is we knew it could hit multiple emotions. You know, Kate Bush's lyrics are so emotional, and we knew that this would play well over Max's memories and remembering all the good times and all that. But then at the same time, the music of Kate Bush is really dramatic in terms of the strings, in terms of the drums, uh, the drums and the percussion and all of that. We wanted to take that and just build on it as Max was running and escaping. So we're having Kate's lyrics, but we're building on the instrumental and orchestration beneath it and having it do a really climactic rise. So that was one thing we were really excited about is that Kate's song had all the layers that we needed to to give Max this building anthem as she's running. But it has that cinematic build. That's what we were looking for. That's why it was the only song, the only song we found we thought could work. She then has to keep this song going on a loop. Basically becomes her armor, her shield against Vecna, that he's not ever gonna be able to reach her as long as Kate Bush is playing. But unlike a normal song, this was so baked into the show that I didn't know what the hell we were gonna do if we ran into issues. But thank God, Kate it was nothing but amazing. And she loved the show and she loved what we were doing with the music and was super supportive. So it was the best partnership and collaboration ever. I think it's exciting when a work of art can be interpreted in different ways and I think certainly there's the one way to look at running up that hill but in the case of our show or specifically in the case of Max it's in in this moment it's reading as something else it takes on a much more hopeful meaning and in the running up that hill becomes almost not literal but an emotional running up the hill of like I can make it and I can make it to the light which, again, wasn't the original context of the song, but in this moment, it takes on a whole new meaning. And I think great works of art can hold up to that, and they can take on more than one meaning, depending on the circumstance and who's listening to it. A, people who grew up with the song, of course, but then with a younger audience. I think that was the big surprise. Any small part we played in introducing Kate Bush to American audiences, yeah, I mean, that's deeply, deeply satisfying, because as an artist, we... We respect and very much we love, you know, she never topped the charts in, in the same way that she did over in the UK for reasons I don't really fully understand. That 
has been deeply satisfying. Just to hear, you know, whether you're at a restaurant or a bar or riding in an Uber and to hear that song start to play is always, it's surreal, but it just always brings a smile to my face because just to know that Kate is getting the sort of both respect and just the audience that she's always deserved over here in the States. Like, I don't think it'll never happen again. People are going, you know, what's the, good is going to be the next, you know, Kate Bush moment or song for season five? There is not going to be another one. I would, it would be so silly to even attempt that. Running Up That Hill is the kind of song that can be taken at face value as an anthem about resilience, but which has many deeper layers of meaning. That the Duffer Brothers tapped its power makes sense, since so much of Kate's work is itself inspired by films or other works of art. A prime example is the most ambitious part of Hounds of Love, a song suite that takes up all of side two, inspired by both a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson and Russian painter Ivan Ivazovsky's 1850 depiction of a boat lost at sea, which gives it its name, the Ninth Wave. From the beginning, the ninth wave was a film. That's how I thought of it. It's the idea of, of this person being in the water. How they've got there, we don't know, but the idea is that they've been on a ship and they've been washed over the side, so they're alone in this water. Now, I find that horrific imagery, the thought of being completely alone at the mercy of their imagination which again, I personally find such a terrifying thing. The power of one's own imagination being let loose on something like that. Through seven songs that unfold like a filmic drama, this delicate, deeply sensual music truly evokes the drifting consciousness of one slowly succumbing to the waves before, thank goodness, the woman is rescued. You must wake up. For me, the ninth wave feels even more relevant now, in light of the climate crisis that is overtaking us all. Come on, wake up. Wake up, love. Hounds of Love began a new phase in Bush's career. The weirdness she embodied now belonged, at least a bit, to everybody. Her next album, The Sensual World, included a song about childbirth that she wrote for the 1988 rom-com She's Having a Baby. Later, it became a smash hit for the R&B singer Maxwell. Songs like this one showed that beyond the fierce eccentricity of her youth, Bush's music is a soundtrack for the inner lives of all kinds of people, because in our imaginations, we all inhabit infinite realms. Musical artists of every genre who embody this inner freedom have expressed their love of Kate, from hip-hop's Big Boy to Bjork. Just this year, jazz singer and composer Cecile McLaurin Salvant found that the themes of Kate's earliest hit perfectly coincided with what she was doing on her album, Ghost Song. When I think of ghosts, I think of yearning and wanting something that is impossible. The album deals with that idea of longing and desire and absence and how those two things play with each other. Wuthering Heights opens the door for what we're going to experience. Like, let me in your window. And then, you know, you imagine that the window is opened and we enter this world of ghosts and memories and loss and desires and darkness. Let me in. 
recorded Wuthering Heights in a church in Manhattan while a snowstorm was coming. It was really cold. I was in a uh, in a winter coat. You had a temper. And I wanted it to feel like a ghost arriving. The sound of the reverberation of the church was a huge part of the track. It's like a begging song. Someone like literally outside in the cold begging to be let in. Somehow when you sing Wuthering Heights a cappella, it becomes kind of a folk song. Something that is totally out of time and feels ancient to me. And so I wanted to lean into the idea of this really ancient song that is fast forwarded into the future. And it actually, it, it can become yeah this sort of prehistoric and futuristic thing at the same time. It's funny to see after a show, it's mostly young kids coming up saying, oh, it's you know, so good to hear that Kate Bush song. And uh, I've even had people be like, how did you know that she was going to blow up? <laughs> like, right after, <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe I'm, you know, for the gift of, of, of seeing into the future, but... <laughs> From the late 80s onwards, Kate began to take increasingly large gaps between records. As she took more time between each, three years, five years, four years, and then more than a decade as she raised her son, Bertie, Kate continued to figure out how the wild spirit that had made her unique could thrive as her own life and relationship to music changed. She made only one album in the 1990s, The Red Shoes, then in 2005, she re-emerged with Ariel, which evokes domestic life with the exploratory spirit she'd brought to so many other spheres. Ariel is her householder album, at times almost ambient in its expansive gentleness. Yet here, as always, Bush makes room for big emotions. As in the erotic reverie Mrs. Bartolozzi, which locates voluptuousness in the ordinary act of doing laundry. Tom Doyle. The line that's always peddled is that Kate Bush has retreated from the normal world. Washing machine. But actually, in my mind, she'd retreated to the normal world. You know, it was an album that was created at home, and it is, in some ways, a domestic record. I mean, you're dealing with sometimes very domestic issues. You know, in Mrs. Bartolozzi, you're dealing with doing the washing. But then, obviously, Kate transports this idea. It's a very mysterious trap because her partner is missing and she's watching their clothes entwine through the porthole of her washer-dryer. And you think, has there been a bereavement here? She said that one of her friends had said, I get the feeling there's been a murder. She loved the idea that people would read this into it, you know, so... Even though she was taking inspiration from domestic matters, I mean, obviously, she's spinning this out into something completely different, which is the mark of a great storyteller. I'd become a mother two years before Ariel came out and could hear in it the way that a supposedly small world, the world of home and family, can expand through the countless tiny new experiences that parenthood brings. By the time Ariel came out, Kate was considered something of a hermit, not engaged with current politics, let alone feminist debates. I don't know that Kate Bush is a feminist. I don't think she is in that sense and that she's not an activist. She's just her own woman, which is a great way to model yourself. Jeanette Winterson again. 
she's always talked directly about a woman's experience and not afraid to talk about it as women being jilted, women being mothers. There's a beautiful song on the kick inside called Room for the Life, where she starts, hey there, you lady in tears, do you think that they care if they're real? Woman, they just take it as part of the deal. So it's hard hitting stuff. You know, this isn't fluffy pop lyrics. It's talking about what it means to, uh, to suffer, to be jilted, to have your heart broken by some guy. And that's not a part of women's experience, which is all kind of autobiography and doesn't matter. It's the real life of a woman in so many ways. And that's what she didn't shy from. She's the kind of singer songwriter who works from who she is and what she is, is a woman. Kate's sustained creative independence continues to be a huge inspiration for emerging artists today. Katie J. Pearson is a young singer-songwriter from Bristol. She's been compared to Kate lyrically and musically, but what she values the most is Kate's resistance to being defined. She wasn't afraid to be seen as scary or intimidating, and I think, especially she was like 18, 19 when she did Wuthering Heights and performed on top of the pops, like... When I was 18, 19, you know, I can't even imagine doing something at such a huge scale. And she was just so intrinsically herself. And I think that's something really empowering and liberating for that for young women of today to see someone like that do that. She just shines a light on the feelings that we feel about being boxed in. You can't define her sound. She's just like, I'm just me. And I think I feel the same. I'm just me and I write these songs and I produce them how I want them to sound. And I'm not trying to be part of any scene. Sound of the morning. Waiting for the light of day still got nothing. Her production style and the sound she uses has been really inspiring for me. I think seeing the kind of absolute variety of noises and percussion and like horn sections and like these more like traditional folk instruments that she uses, I just love the freedom that she expresses and you can see that in the studio has complete liberty to do whatever the hell she wants. It makes you think, okay, even these wild ideas that I might have do work. And actually on Sound of the Morning, I had this flute line that my friend wrote and my producer was like, oh, it's a bit kind of far out for the track. And I was like, no, it's perfect. And actually at the time I'd been listening to the Central World Lows and the kind of medieval folk side of it that you can hear in the fog and the Central World. I think definitely inspired me to put that flute part on there. Um, so yeah, thank you to Kate for that um, record because it's so good. In many ways, Kate is the perfect artist for Gen Z musicians who are so eager to control every aspect of their output, from the songs to the production to the music videos and to retain a fluidity of movement among different styles. She's not just one thing, I think she covers all bases. That's something that is very apparent today if you're an artist. A lot of people, and even these big pop stars, they are all encompassing with their art, their music videos, and they want everything to be part of a package. But I think the way that she's done it is like extraordinary. <laughs> and it was at a time where technology also isn't where it is now, and she still created amazing pieces of art. On her latest studio album, 50 Words for Snow, made in 2011, Kate takes another surprising turn. She goes back to the piano, creating songs that are long, trance-like meditations, very far away from the tightly structured pop songs we love so much, like Running Up That Hill. Yet still she gives us something cinematic, all reflecting a central theme. Words for Snow evokes the effects of winter, the way the chill and the quiet and the white can seem to stop time, 
can preserve bodies and other living things, can seem to erase the line between what's living and what is departed. Kate's primal energy still burns. For instance, there's a song about a sexual encounter with a snowman. But this is music made by a woman who is not afraid of death, of her own approaching winter and what it will bring. Kate's most recent musical act was in 2014, and it was a miracle for her fans. She staged a London residency of 22 shows. Kate remains the only artist whose music lives at the core of my being, but whom I've never seen in concert. The album she made from those shows is a gift to all of us, as is her entire back catalog, really. I am just loving the thought of a whole new generation on the cusp of discovering all of those riches. For me, Kate Bush will always be an elemental spirit, constantly resurfacing, showing me how to dream in new ways. For those of you about to embark on this journey, enjoy exploring wherever you end up. Thank you. What a lovely welcome. Thank you. Kate Bush, The Power of Strange Things, was presented by Ann Powers and produced by Clem Hitchcock. The programme is a Just Radio production for Radio 4.